This afternoon, you know, since we're in Southern California, we always are exposed to the to the tourist industry and, and Disneyland and stuff. So this is going to be kind of like Tomorrowland. So we're going to talk about things uh, that we might hopefully be able to use in the future about where we're going with where people are going with research and get some ideas <coughs> and feedback. So these talks are are less clinical and more hopefully basic science uh, about what what we're learning. Um, the first talk is the potato and the tailpipe. I don't know if you guys know that expression, but um, <clears throat> and it's talking about mitochondria again, which is great. And I think that may be actually feeding into uh, what Dr. Yang was talking about. But uh, Brian Kuniff, Dr. Kuniff is a uh, faculty scientist at the University of Vermont College of Medicine where he got his PhD in molecular biology, and he's been interested in mitochondrial structure and function, and particularly how it influences signal path signaling pathways that are irrelevant to cancer and, and, uh, and kind of common pathways for, for cancer, uh, tumor survival, proliferation, and migration, and uh, met metastasis, obviously. So he is going to talk to us about the potato and the tailpipe. Uh, and disabling mitochondrial perox peroxide metabolism as an effective therapeutic approach for MPM. So, Dr. Carter. Uh, well, thank you very much. I really appreciate the invitation to speak here. It's been a very interesting morning, I'm learning a lot about the clinical sides of mesothelioma. <clears throat> and. Um, I, uh, I think it's, as, as Dr. Cameron had alluded to, it, thinking about other approaches to target mesothelioma uh, and new pathways, uh, new drugs, and new phenotypes that could be potential uh, therapeutic uh, avenues. And so I need to disclose I'm a consultant for Paradox Therapeutics, which is a new uh, startup biotech company involved in identifying uh, molecular mechanisms that are targetable in cancers such as malignant mesothelioma. So today we're going to talk about the mitochondria a bit as you just were introduced to before and the relevance of what the role the mitochondria plays in tumorigenesis and specifically in malignant mesothelioma. So the mitochondria is an organelle in our cells and every single one of our cells that is primarily used to produce energy. And so uh, they're dynamic organelles as you can see in this movie. This is a movie of a cell crawling under a microscope and the red are the mitochondria. They're very dynamic. They're breaking apart. They're moving to different locations and this is required to fuel uh, processes with energy in the cell. But there's also other components of the mitochondria that are important, as we heard earlier, uh, such as calcium buffering and uh, the production of reactive oxygen species, which if you've been alive, you know what the consequences of dysregulated reactive oxygen species are in damaging cellular, cellular macromolecules in your DNA and its role in tumor genesis. So the mitochondria are dysregulated in numerous diseases, uh, and these processes are dysregulated. <clears throat> and so primarily what we're going to focus on today is the uh, metabolism of a primary metabolite from the mitochondria. So uh, mitochondria metabolize um, uh, or transfer electrons across the electron transport chain, and this is involved in the production of ATP, the primary molecule, uh, energy producing molecule in the cell. As a byproduct of uh, metabolism, we have the formation of reactive oxygen species, and that occurs through electron leakage at these sites in the mitochondria. So in all of your cells, you're having some electron leakage, you're getting some reactive oxygen species that are made, and typically antioxidant systems in the cell are uh, sufficient to metabolize these reactive oxygen species. And so that is a stepwise uh, dismutation of superoxide is this prompt pro uh, uh, damaging molecule into hydrogen peroxide, which can act as a signaling molecule, and this is further metabolized into this innocuous molecule water. Uh, and in the mitochondria, this is primarily done by two enzymes, one being superoxide dismutase and the other being peroxyridoxin-3. And so you'll hear me talk a lot about peroxyridoxin-3 in the next few slides, uh, as this is a primary target of um, some new anti-cancer compounds that we are investigating in the lab. So uh, we've heard a lot about mutations, and we've learned a lot about uh, abnormal phenotypes in cancer, and there's uh, essentially the point I want to get across. We've heard about the hallmarks of cancer, 
is that there's lots of different ways to skin the cat. You can develop mutations in numerous genes, you can overexpress numerous proteins, you can knock out tumor suppressor genes, and these all lead to tumorigenesis and these all support tumorigenesis. But what we're focused on is not what's feeding into this abnormal metabolic phenotype that is driving tumor cell proliferation and tumor cell growth, but what are the downstream effects of this abnormal metabolic phenotype. So you can have all sorts of genetic alterations that feed into this, you can have changes in the tumor microenvironment, but this is all leading to scenarios that help the tumor cell uh, survive, whether it's changing its bioenergetics, increasing uh, molecules for biosynthesis, or maintaining a, a redox balance. And so the redox balance is essentially producing reactive oxygen species, but also metabolizing reactive oxygen species so that you don't choke on your own exhaust. So that's where the potato on the tailpipe comes, is when you're burning, when you're burning molecules to produce energy, you're gonna have a waste product that comes out your tailpipe. So what's been recently appreciated uh, in studying tumorigenesis is this stepwise transformation that occurs, where in normal tissue you have a balance of the production and the metabolism of reactive oxygen species. And that's this graph here, as you see up here we have the reactive oxygen species levels as we're going through our neoplastic transformation uh, based on loss of tumor suppressor genes and change in bioenergetics, you get this increase in reactive oxygen species. And the only way for the tumor cell to survive is to now develop a program to combat that increased level of reactive oxygen species. And those are these dotted lines that are coming down. And as you increase and, and you get uh, more and more tumor cells and you have a change in the tumor microenvironment, the level of reactive oxygen species get very high. And what these red arrows are, now a newly appreciated approach that um, ironically is most likely the mechanism of a lot of chemotherapeutic drugs, is this potentiation of the redox status by increasing reactive oxygen species. So a pro-oxidant therapeutic approach. So um, our, our approach and what we're studying in the lab is to target redox adaptations in mesothelioma. So as we've heard before, that we have these activation of tumor suppressors, or activation of oncogenes and loss of tumor suppressors, and this leads to enhanced, enhanced production of reactive oxygen species, primarily from the mitochondria and NADPH oxidases. And so this is uh, a very important step in tumorigenesis, where if they want to survive, the tumor cells want to proliferate, they now need to have a phenotypic adaptation uh, to counteract these uh, increase in reactive oxygen species, and that is the changing in the antioxidant enzyme profile. And so the altered energy and oxidant metabolism that leads to cancer is likely a common set of adaptive genes. So instead of trying to target individual modalities at the top of this, we're looking down at the bottom. So it doesn't matter what is leading into this altered metabolism, it's the fact that the phenotype exists that we can target it. <clears throat> so I don't think I really need to go into detail on this slide about uh, what mesothelioma is and, and where it is located, but I just wanted to bring up the model systems that we use in the lab. So I'm not going to talk anything about human patients today, but I am going to talk about human mesothelioma cell lines that we culture in the lab and use as a first-line investigative tool, and then about a xenoplant mouse model in which we take human tumor cells and inject them into the mouse to grow tumors, and then use that as our in vivo model to, for testing our drugs. So years of work in the lab and in other labs, we've identified that mesotheliomas have a feature called, uh, have maintain a feature of a reactive oxygen species driven tumor. And there are some genetic things that occur that um, characterize these as uh, reactive oxygen species tumors. And then there's also some phenotypic adaptations that occur. And so in the black are um, published results from Frieden and Arbusser basically focusing on melanoma of the features of a reactive oxygen species tumor, and these are identified in mesothelioma. And then in our lab, we also feel that we've uh, identified uh, other components of what a reactive oxygen species could be, what reactive oxygen species driven tumor, that being the expression of uh, an enzyme in the mitochondria that produces reactive oxygen species, altered mitochondrial redox status, uh, changes in the mitochondrial architecture, as well as the overexpression of this oncogenic transcription tr factor called FOXM1. So just to set the baseline, mesotheliomas have the characteristics of a reactive oxygen species tumor, meaning they have the potential to respond to treatments that uh, alter this redox status. So we went on to char characterize the uh, metabolic phenotype of mesothelioma cells uh, in culture. And so just quickly, I'll go through some of this primary data. 
Um, someone earlier said they weren't gonna bore you with molecular mechanisms, but I'm going to, so sorry. But essentially what we see on the left here, uh, we use a normal uh, immortalized mesothelial cell, and we use that to compare against a panel of human malignant mesothelioma tumor lines that we maintain in the lab. So on the left, what we see here is that the majority of these mesothelioma tumor cells have increased mitochondrial oxidants. So they're under increased oxidative stress in the mitochondria. Furthermore, they have reorganized their metabolism uh, in which they are very susceptible to changes in the redox environment in the mitochondria, not to go into too much detail. Furthermore, these three panels show that compared to normal mesothelial cells, malignant mesothelioma tumor cells either overexpress or turn on uh, antioxidant pathways. And this is to counteract this increased level of reactive oxygen species they need to adapt to the environment. If they do not, as I showed in the slides before, they either go into senescence or they'll die. So we've identified that this is a signature of malignant mesothelioma tumor cells. And furthermore, we've investigated what are the players involved in this phenotypic adaptation. And one of those we've identified is forkhead box uh, M1 protein. And this is a uh, oncogenic transcription factor that is overexpressed in every carcinoma studied to date. And um, what we find in mesothelioma cells is, uh, compared to normal cells, they express a lower isoform of this protein, which has been characterized as the oncogenic isoform. This is uh, transcriptional data from that um, in both of these. And then this is to show that when you withdraw growth factors, they still maintain the expression of FOXM1. So normal cells express this protein to help them go through mitosis and it's dependent on the presence of growth factors, whereas mesothelioma cells, they don't care if there's any growth factors around, they just continue to express this gene. Um, so it's constitutively activated. So we initially, so the role, the other role that FOXM1 plays in tumor cells is to help to maintain this redox status. So uh, looking at the expression level of FOXM1 in fibroblasts, in the presence of peroxide, the expression level goes up and in the presence of an antioxidant, it goes down. So FOXM1 is tuned to the redox environment of the cell. And it was identified in a very interesting paper that uh, after oncogene activation, you have oxidative stress. And FOXM1 is required to mediate that increase in oxidative stress by overexpressing these antioxidant proteins, the ones I described before, which are the primary mitochondrial antioxidant enzymes. So in this model, if you activate an oncogene in, without FOXM1 present, these cells go into oncogene-induced senescence, and they don't grow into tumors. So FOXM1 has been characterized as the uh, gatekeeper of oncogenesis. <clears throat> so interesting is that FOXM1 leads to the overexpression or the overactivation of these antioxidant enzymes. So what I'm going to describe to you today with some uh, molecular mechanisms is compounds that inhibit this major antioxidant network in mitochondrial in the mitochondria of mesothelioma cells. And this is this downstream pathway that is uh, involved in detoxifying mitochondrial reactive oxygen species. And this is composed of three main proteins, thyroidoxin reductase 2, thyroidoxin 2, and peroxidoxin 3. And they act in this pathway here where peroxidoxin 3, the main player, metabolizes hydrogen peroxide and is regenerated through a series of steps one by reduction by thyroidoxin 2 back to an active enzyme. So this is the primary mode of uh, metabolizing hydrogen peroxide in the mitochondria. So the two com compounds I'm going to describe to you today are actually off-patent drugs that were originally developed for different purposes. Uh, thiostreptin is a thiazole antibiotic. It was originally identified as an inhibitor of FOXM1 uh, by uh, interfering with the proteasome. But we further have gone on to show that it actually leads to the irreversible adduction and inactivation of this mitochondrial antioxidant protein, PRX3. Uh, furthermore, gentian violet, which is probably not uh, foreign to many of the people in here, uh, it's been used in the clinic before, it's still used in veterinary, uh, veterinary applications, as well as a FOXM1 inhibitor, um, but also inhibits this other protein that's involved in the regeneration of peroxidoxin 3, that being thyroidoxin 2, and that was identified uh, first by Jack Arbiter's lab, I believe, and then we further on went to show that it inhibits thyroidoxin 2. So these are two compounds that uh, interfere with mitochondrial redox homeostasis. And so just to give a little clarity to the situation, what I just described there is we have this enzyme, peroxidoxin 3, that is overexpressed and hyperactive in mesothelioma. It's metabolizing hydrogen peroxide, 
We have one drug that's targeting it and inactivating, and another drug that is targeting and inactivating this enzyme. And so I'm gonna to describe to you what we believe is the molecular mechanism of this in cells and how this leads to specific tumor cell death. And just for clarity, I'm gonna be showing a lot of these amino blots um, for peroxyridoxin-3. So peroxyridoxin-3 is a head-to-tail dimer. Uh, in its reduced state, if you were to look at it on a Western blot, it would run at this 25 kilodalton monomer. If you were to run a non-reducing gel, so we're gonna leave it as dimers, it'll run as this higher species. But in the presence of thiostreptin, this runs as an irreversible dimerized protein. And what that indicates is that we've uh, irreversibly inactivated the protein. So we went on to characterize the mechanism of and the downstream phenotype of peroxidoxin or of thiostreptin. So thiostreptin, as I said, both in cells and in a uh, in vitro assay, adducts uh, peroxidoxin three into these higher molecular weight species. And this process comes along with an increase in oxidative stress, both in the mitochondria of cells and in isolated mitochondria. So we have a compound that's inactivating a resident antioxidant enzyme, and this is leading to an increase in reactive oxygen species. Secondly, we have another compound that is uh, blocking the activity of this enzyme, thyrodoxin 2, which is required to reduce these disulfide bonded dimers down to the active enzyme. And under non-reducing conditions, we see this drug increases the amount of the dimer of PRX3 and potentiates the adduction by thiostreptin. Uh, furthermore, the combination of these two drugs, this is just a readout of mitochondrial uh, reactive oxygen species, the combination of the drug increases the levels of reactive oxygen species over any of the parent compounds alone. So these drugs are working together to potentiate oxidative stress in cells. So we went to check whether or not these had any effect on uh, cell growth. So we did these kill curves, uh, looking at both primary mesothelial cells, uh, normal mesothelioma cells, and then at two uh, mesothelioma tumor cell lines. And what we find is that the uh, inhibitory concentration of the drug in tumor cells is anywhere from uh, 30 to uh, five times uh, less in tumor cells than in normal cells. And just to quickly run through this left side here, we believe that's because of the rate of adduction by the drug to the resident antioxidant enzyme. And so in primary mesothelial cells or normal cells, you see over time of treatment with thiostreptin, you have this slight increase in the modification to the protein, but in tumor cells, you have this drastic increase. So that implies that the turnover rate of the enzyme, uh, which is dictated by the, the redox environment in the mitochondria, dictates the efficacy of the compound. Um, so this shows that it's more specific to tumor cells than normal cells. And so we went on to actually prove that to be true as the mechanism, so we used two approaches. One, we pre-incubated cells with gentian violet, and this basically uh, captures this species in cells and then added thiostreptin in, and we see over time we get an increase in the amount of adduct that's formed. Secondly, we block the formation of this adduct with a uh, chemical called dimidone, which will block this process here. So we never form this species, and we see that we can basically block the ability for thiostreptin to adduct the uh, intermediate. Lastly, we went on to show this in a purified system. I'm not gonna bore you with the molecular details of this, but essentially what this is implying on the left in this in vitro system, and we also were able to capture this by mass spec, is that the intermediate in the reaction is the target for thiostreptin. And the reason that thiostreptin is adducting more PRX3 in tumor cells is because that intermediate is more readily available because they're under more oxidative stress. And by uh, co-incubating these with the gentian violet, we are uh, potentiating the formation of this disulfide bond here that is now allowing for the drug to be uh, cross-linked these two proteins. <clears throat> And that is described here by this slide. And so essentially, the, the catalysis of the enzyme to uh, metabolize hydrogen peroxide, uh, in the presence of hydrogen peroxide, a disulfide bond is formed with the protein. And during that disulfide bond formation in the protein, there's a local unfolding, which we believe is a uh, prerequisite for the activity of the compound. And um, in tumor cells, that formation is happening at a, at a faster rate, and so that's where we believe the sensitivity of the compound comes from. 
Uh, lastly, in a cell culture model, we went on to show that if we were to uh, knock out peroxyredoxin-3, so we used cells that were uh, not expressing peroxyredoxin-3, and we looked at their growth rate, and if you see here, uh, if you get rid of PRX3, these cells grow much slower, indicating that the expression levels of PRX3 is supporting growth of the tumor cell. If we were to overexpress a different antioxidant enzyme, instead of PRX3, we now can rescue that growth. Uh, and furthermore, if we treat cells with thiostreptin and we don't have PRX3 around, but we maintain the redox status of the cell, these cells are basically uh, unaffected by the presence of thiostreptin. And so what that shows us is that peroxyredoxin-3 is actually a relevant target of the drug. So the uh, in vitro molecular mechanisms that I've described to you is that there are specific cysteine residues that become exposed in peroxyredoxin-3 that are a target of thiostreptin. And the formation of this species is dependent on, uh, or is, is potentiated by the increase in reactive oxygen species that are in the mitochondria. Um, the drugs correlate with the increased basal redox status that is uh, found in tumor cells. Um, and then by getting rid of PRX3, we show that it's actually a relevant target of thiostreptin. Um, and we have other compounds and other directions to potentiate the activity of thiostreptin um, that we believe could be used in a clinical application. Uh, lastly, we used our uh, xenoplant mouse model to test whether or not this had any in vivo application. And with this, we take uh, our human malignant mesothelioma tumor cells and we inject those into immunocompromised mice uh, intraperitoneal. And then we did a, uh, a combination of approaches where we either would inject uh, single agents alone, so five milligrams per kilogram thiostreptin, or a higher dose of thiostreptin, and then a low dose of gentian violet, or a combination of the two. And after five weeks of treatment uh, every other day, we would then uh, euthanize and collect the tumors and do some investigation. And so these are what the tumors look like when they grow in the mice. So um, what we found was that uh, we would have basically a low dosage of thiostreptin had little to no effect on the on the tumor volume as compared to vehicle-controlled mice. Uh, a high dose of uh, thiostreptin we found would reduce the cell vol or the tumor volume by about 32%, or down to 32%. <clears throat> Gentian violet alone had uh, modest effects at reducing the volume of the uh, tumor, but the combination of both drugs at low doses was the most potent. And so this is a very interesting and exciting finding because it's saying that the uh, by redu we can use the combination of the compounds at much lower doses, and so there's been a lot of talk this morning about delivery of drugs and um, you know, increasing the local concentration to the tumor, and so this is very exciting that we can actually use far less drug in combination to get a, very, a much greater uh, activity and tumor killing possibility. Furthermore, if we take these tumors and we grind up the tissue and look, we can find the uh, TR, the thiostreptin peroxyredoxin-3 complex in these tumors. Um, so that tells us that the molecular mechanism in vivo is similar to that what we're finding in vitro. So just to summarize, I'll end early so you don't have to listen to the molecular mechanisms too much more. But we've, what we've identified, and I think that is really important uh, in studying all of tumor biology is that these tumor cells have an altered metabolism and this establishes a vulnerability for a therapeutic intervention. So the, the method of getting to this redox vulnerability doesn't really matter. So we're just targeting a downstream pathway. Um, and by inhibiting the activity of this uh, primary pathway in the mitochondria from metabolizing hydrogen peroxide, we can selectively kill tumor cells. And normal cells are relatively unharmed by this because they have this uh, different metabolic phenotype. They're not growing as fast, and they don't have this change in the redox status. Uh, furthermore, we find that uh, combining the drugs in low concentration uh, reduces tumor volume in vivo. Um, and that the mechanism uh, appears to be the same in vivo as in vitro. So uh, as we alluded to in the beginning, this is the potato and the tailpipe approach where tumors are choking on their own metabolic exhaust. Uh, and so right now we're working with a company to try and uh, push these to get FDA approval and get these into the clinic uh, as soon as possible so that we can start seeing if they have any effect in patients. 
Uh, with that, I want to just thank everybody who's helped out with this project over the past few years. Uh, we've had money from lots of different institutions, including MARF and our cancer center, uh, as well as the Society for Free Radical Biology and Medicine, and, and now currently from Paradox Therapeutics. And thank you for your attention.